The name of this video is the hexagon of charges. So, this is an example where we're going to use Coulomb's law and the superposition principle to solve a very simple problem, yet a very important problem. What is the problem? Let us consider hexagon, which has obviously six vertices. Okay, this hexagon resides on this plane. So one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going, I'm going to sketch it in a minute. This is our hexagon on this plane. Of course, it belongs to a circle, which has a center, the same as the center of the hexagon. What we want, we want to calculate, we want to, we will assume that there are a six, a six point like charged particles, if one at each vertex of the hexagon, so one, two, three, four, five, six point like charges at the vertices of the hexagon, we then want to place a test charge Q naught somewhere on the so-called vertical axis of the hexagon. So in this direction, vertical axis of the hexagon. And this axis goes to the center of the circle, which includes the hexagon. On this axis, we, place, we will place a test charge Q0 and we want to compute the electric force on that charge. In particular, let's be more specific, the electrostatic force on that charge. Okay, so let's make a sketch of this problem. So first of all, I want to do a 3D sketch up here. So in order to do a 3D sketch, the circle which encloses the hexagon, I'm going to look at it from an angle to give some perspective. And so in order to do so, I'm going to sketch the circle as a sort of a ellipse, okay, which is three-dimensionality. So don't get confused by that. I know that in the past people always got confused with this sketch. So let me try to do it as nice and as simple as possible. So this is our ellipse, which has a center here, and again, it's a 3D rendering of a circle, okay? So this is the center of this circle in 3D. So then let's then show here these axes, which are the diameters, which, are, which is a subset of diameters of this circle. Here we place a point-like charge particle, here we place a point-like charge particle, one here, one here, so we have four of the six. So obviously, we need also this other diameter and the two point-like charge particles opposite of each other. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six particles. This is the center of the circle. All right, so let us hypothesize that the radius of the circle from this point to this point is capital R. The axis here of the central vertical axis of this circle and thus of the hexagon is this one. And let's say that we want to compute the force due to the six point-like charge particles on a test charge Q0 somewhere here on the vertical axis. Okay, this is our vertical axis. So again, we are looking at the field in this direction, on this axis. All right, so now that we have all this construction here in front of us, let's say that each of these point-like charge particles has a, has a charge, Q divided by six. I could just call it Q, but I divide it by six because as you will see in a minute, we need to multiply by six to use the superposition principle. So each of them is Q6. So this is also Q6, etc. All right, so all of them are Q6 is the charge of one of these six uh, charges. Now, let's uh, resketch the same system here, uh, but looking at it from the side. So I could look at it from any side I want. For example, I could pick this pair of opposite charges here, or this pair of opposite charges, or this pair of opposite charges, and look at this structure from the side. So I'm looking at it from the side. So let me look at this, let me get this again. This is our circle with the hexagon in it. This is the vertical axis. Now I want to look at it from the side. So I can choose any of these diameters I want. For example, let's choose this diameter here. Let me sketch this in, uh, um, let me highlight it with this color. So I choose this pair. So I choose 
one of the uh, three pairs of opposite charges. Is one of the three pairs of opposite charges. One pair, two pairs, three pairs. Three pairs of opposite charges. Good. Okay, I choose this one, and I look at the system from the side, so we need to do a projection here. So let me do this projection in a very simple manner. Okay, this is the central axis, and now here we have the opposite charge. Okay, so now this would be, let's say, one charge here. This is one diameter. This is another charge opposite with respect to this charge, with respect to the center of the circle, and this center we call it O. This is the center of the circle, so this is O. Okay, the test. Uh, charge Q naught, we place it, let's say, somewhere here. This is a charge Q naught, so I'm looking at it from the side. This is the problem we want to solve. So we will begin to solve the problem for one particle, maybe for two particles, a pair of particles opposite of each other, and then we need to extend it to the three pairs of particles, for a total of six particles, one, two, three, four, five, six for the hexagon. Okay, now, every time you attempt to solve the problem in this course, you must follow four rules. Four. Four rules. And you must do it all the time, in all home assignments, in all tests. It has to be like this. Four rules, please. Remember all of them. Here they are. Step number one. We need to choose a specific coordinate system for this problem. Let's remember that these charges are fixed in an inertial reference frame. So the charges are fixed in an inertial reference frame. RF stands for reference frame. Hereafter. Okay. So in green, I will show it's always in green, the first step, which is step one. We need to choose a coordinate system. In brief, CS, coordinate system. And I use this green color. In this case, I could choose an x-axis, a y-axis, an x-axis or a z-axis, so a sort of two-dimensional Cartesian, but since actually we have a circle, I prefer that we use straight away a cylindrical coordinate system. So in 3D, this would be R, this one O corresponds to the center of the circle as well as the origin of this cylindrical coordinate system and the axis, the vertical axis of uh, this object is z, okay? And of course, there is also an angle, which I'm not going to discuss too much in detail here. We, we will not need it this time. An angle bar phi, this symbol is bar phi, okay? And so, O r bar phi z, O r bar phi z, the origin r bar phi z is our cylindrical coordinate system. This is the cylindrical coordinate system we want to use. Okay. So the R-axis, if I choose this as the pair of uh, charges I want to examine first, will be this one here. This is our R-axis. Okay. And this will be our, obviously, Z-axis. The center of the circle, again, coincides with the origin of the cylindrical coordinate system. Okay. At this point, that's the first step. So let me re-enumerate all the steps that we are following here so that they are crystal clear. So step one, choose a coordinate system. We have chosen a cylindrical. Perfect. Second step of the four steps to solve properly any problem. 
actually in physics in general, not only for electromagnetism. The second step is to find all forces acting in this system, in particular the forces acting on Tim Nutt, because there we want to find the total force. Okay, so what are the total forces? Well, let's sketch them in red, as always, forces in red. This point-like particle here, which charge Q6, according to Coulomb's law, which now we know, will result, will generate a force along the straight line connecting it to the test particle as such. So this is the force on Q0 due to this one of the six point-like charge particles here. Similarly, this other particle will generate a force like this along this straight line which connects these two particles. So these are our two forces, okay? Two of the six, and again, I do the argument for two forces, and then I can repeat it for the other two pairs of, part of particles. It's the same thing. Okay, so these are the forces. So we identify two of the six forces, the other are the same, because we can just rotate the system. So by rotation, by rotation we can obtain all forces. So the second step was find all forces acting on the system, okay? Check on that. Step number three, the third step, which we want to follow now, which we want to do now, it's a very important step. In this step, you want to get a qualitative sense of what's going on with this problem. And this is called, this step is called to find the degrees of freedom. of this problem, D-O-F, degrees of freedom. So how do we find the degrees of freedom of this problem? Well, let's first examine these first two particles, which are opposite of each other. One, one of the three pairs of particles which makes this hexagon. Okay, so if we do so, let's decompose each of these two forces along the R and Z axis. So along the R axis, we are going to find this component for this force, and this component for this force. So we're going to have an FR and a minus FR, which are opposite of each other. So we're going to have, for the R axis, for one pair, we're going to have FR minus FR, which means zero for one pair of particles. Actually, it's not for each, it's just for one pair of particles. For one pair of particles. Okay, great. What about the z-axis? On the z-axis, let's decompose these two forces, one for each particle. So the first one will give me this force, and the second one, an equal force in the same direction. So they sum up. So we get a force Fz and another force Fz for a total of two times Fz. So along the z-axis, we're going to have Fz plus Fz, which gives me for one pair, two times Fz, this argument is for one pair, which means for the three pairs, of course, along the r-axis, the total uh, sum of all fr is going to be equal to zero, whereas on the z-axis, the total sum of the fz's is going to be six times fz. So again, two times for one pair, I have three pairs, three times two is six, that's why I have 6z here, 6 times fz. So that's what we are looking for. Okay, what are the degrees of freedom? Well, this particle q0 is free to move along the z-axis. So q0 free to move along the z-axis. Now, if we remember the second law of Newton, f equal ma, 
the all the components all the components of the acceleration a are by definition the degrees of freedom so in this specific case for one pair obviously the only way the acceleration can go is along the z axis so for one pair is z the degree of freedom but the same argument applies for the other two uh, pairs because they are indistinguishable from each other so obviously the degree of freedom in our case is going to be just z the z axis this particle cannot cannot can only go up and down and therefore accelerate along the z axis okay and so we are finding we are trying to find this force which generates this acceleration which is along the z axis and this force is the electric force due to the six particle so the degree of freedom in this case is z not that we already kind of used a concept of uh, a symmetry in this uh, problem so we kind of use already the co a concept of symmetry okay so we just uh, and how did we use it we use it in the following sense we uh, tackle the problem only looking at one pair look at one of three pairs of particles and then we extracted our result we extrapolate our result for all the three pairs just saying that if I look at this pair of particles here, obviously a similar argument will apply for this pair of particles and this pair of particles. Why is that? Because obviously if I rotate by any of these angles this uh, object, I obtain the same result. Okay, So this, if I rotate by 2 pi divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I get the same result. So this is a symmetry. We will come back on this concept of symmetry a lot how this course, uh, particularly after Gauss's theorem. All right, so now that we know the degree of freedom, the only degree of freedom this problem is along the z-axis, so it's z, the last step to solve a problem, so step four, in this case is to use Coulomb's law plus the superposition principle. So how do we do this step? How do we proceed with this step? So from Coulomb's law, we know that if I take this one particle and I want to compute the force acting on Q0, the test particle there, we know that this force in magnitude is given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the electric constant, times the charge down here, the source charge, which is Q divided by 6, Q6, times the charge Q0, which is the test charge right there. This, we need to divide it by the uh, distance between Q6 and Q0 square, and let's call this distance here capital A, 1 over capital A quantity square. And of course, the direction would be the straight line between Q over 6 and Q0. However, we know that the R component of this force doesn't matter because it doesn't contribute to the final degree of freedom. And so the only component we are interested in is this Z component. If we call this angle here theta, this angle here will also be theta, obviously. So if we do that, we will need the cosine theta of this force. So we need to project this force along the z-axis. To project it along the z-axis, we need to multiply times cosine of theta. By doing so, we obtain the z component of the force, of one of the six forces, so we need to remember to multiply times six to get the final result. All right, good. What about cosine of theta? Cosine of theta, since theta, this theta is the same as this theta, can be found simply by dividing z, z, which is this distance from the center, from the origin O to the uh, test charge Q0, is z, that's where we place our Q0, we place the z distance, z divided by a, z over a is our cosine theta, which is equal to z divided by, what is a? This quantity is capital R, this quantity here, so it's r squared plus d squared under square root, so capital R squared, plus the Pythagorean theorem under square root 
z divided by this quantity is z over a. Okay, so we know what's over this a, so a squared is nothing but r squared plus z squared. Okay, so when we plug this in back here, we obtain as a result 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over 6 times q naught times 1 over a squared cosine theta. So a squared is nothing but r squared plus d squared, power of 1 half squared, which means it's just the Pythagorean theorem, r squared plus d squared. So it's r squared plus d squared to the power of 1, which I need to multiply its time the square root of r squared plus d squared. So I obtain r squared plus d squared, 1 plus 1 half is 1.5 is 3 half. So r squared plus z squared to the power of 3 half and z up here from the cosine of theta. So we have cosine of theta over a square is z over this r squared plus d squared to the power of 3 half. Note that this power of 3 half is very typical, it's typical. This is a typical structure that we will find in many different problems, okay? So remember this 3 half is very common. Okay, the direction of this, let's start to put a direction here, is along the uz, which is the unit vector, the unit vector along the z-axis. So uz is the unit vector along the z-axis. uz, unit z. But it's not over yet, because this is the force along the z-axis from one particle. I need to multiply times 6. And so I multiply times 6, so this 6 and 6 goes away. And so the result is, for the total force, nothing but 1 over 4, 4 pi epsilon naught, q, q naught, z over r squared plus d squared to the power of 3 half along the z-axis. So this is our final result. Now, it's always good to make some sanity checks. And so, what is one nice sanity check we can do in this case? One nice sanity check to see if what we calculated makes sense or not, and note that, of course, the only degree of freedom is d, so that already makes sense. But, uh, for example, suppose that I uh, start to move my particle q0 very far away from z. That is, I assume that z becomes much larger than, uh, let's say, capital R, okay? So I'm going very, very far away so that the circle becomes very small, so I'm much larger than R. Well, the question I have for you now, I'm observing these hexagonal charges, not from close by, but from very, very far. So I kind of blurry, it looks blurry. I don't actually, can, I cannot accurately recognize the six charges anymore. It looks like more or less a single lump a system with one single charge. So in these conditions, what do you think would be approximately the total force, uh, the amplitude of the total force uh, for this system approximately? And I, as always, I encourage you to discuss with your colleagues this in Piazza. Furthermore, what happens when z goes all the way to plus infinite? What happens to the total force in that case? Discuss also this in piazza. All right. So in this video, we solved our very first problem using Coulomb's law superposition principle. It was the problem of the hexagon. What are the key items that we discussed here? First of all, do a nice sketch of your problem, understand your problem. Then the four steps to solve the problem successfully R1 to choose a proper coordinate system. I've chosen a cylindrical coordinate system in this case. You can try to solve it with a Cartesian. Try to do that. Second step is to identify all forces acting on the system. The third step is try to identify the degrees of freedom of the system. The fourth and last step in this case is to write down the solution by means of Coulomb's law and the superposition principle. Note that the superposition principle in this case comes in when we do this multiplication by 6. That's effectively the superposition principle. Until then, we were basically using just a uh, Coulomb's law projected along one axis. Symmetries are important. We'll come back to this extensively. So don't worry too much about it right now. And, and so that's, you, you solve this problem. Please discuss uh, in piazza among yourselves uh, these limiting cases, which are good sanity checks to understand if uh, the physics of this problem makes sense or not. 
and that is all.